Come to our scriptures this morning, and I invite you to either look in the bulletin or look on the screen. I'd like for us to read together from Psalm 118. This is our scripture memory verses for this week. Psalm 118, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. Would you read these with me, please? Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. Let's pray together. Father God, we hear you this morning through Psalm 118. Call to us, call to those who are in distress to say, to call upon you, and you will be by our side, and you will be our helper. We hear the psalmist say, for what can man do to me? And we're very mindful that actually humans can do quite a bit and can bring a lot of pain and frustration into our lives. And yet the scriptures and the psalmist and the spirit is saying, out of our distress, call to you. It's better to trust in you than any other source. So Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit this morning would simply speak to our hearts and help us to see why it is we should trust in you in a very broken and very complex world. So, Father, we ask that you'd speak this morning. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Fritz Haber. Fritz Haber was a German chemist, early 1900s in Germany, won the Nobel Prize in 1918 for his method of synthesizing ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen gas. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but what I do know is that agriculture is, is dependent upon nitrogen being in the soil, and up until this point was basically dependent upon animal waste as fertilizer, but the problem was not enough nitrogen was getting into the soil. The world's population was booming, and there was great concern about whether the soil would be able to food this growing population in the world, and so he came up with a process to mass-produce nitrogen fertilizer that basically radically changed the world's food supply. In fact, today, uh, over half of the world's food production is dependent upon this method of producing nitrogen fertilizer. Fritz Haber literally changed the world for a better place and continues to change it today. Fritz Haber was German and a good German citizen. So when World War I broke out, he was a good patriot, and he went to help his nation fight the war. And as a chemist... He began to use his skills in chemistry to fight the battle on the front of World War I. He was the architect of chemical warfare in World War I with the German army. German army. He was the one who figured out the principle of how concentrated the gas should be for what period of time in order to produce a lethal effect. It's actually named after him. It's called Haber's Rule. He was a director of chemical warfare. His wife, Clara, was also a chemist. She was the first female to earn a Ph.D. in chemistry in Germany, and she was horrified that he was using his chemistry as weapons of mass destruction. And he begged, she begged her husband to stop. He refused. She went out in the family garden and committed suicide, to which Haber responded by going into work and continuing to work on chemical weapons. He died in 1934 in exile because between World War I and World War II, there was a governmental shift in Germany. The Nazi party arose, and he had to flee Germany because he was a Jew. And after his death, the German Nazi party used his very research to develop Zyklon B, which was the gas used in concentration camps to kill millions of his own people, the Jews. So let me ask you. How do you evaluate Fritz Haber's life? Was he a hero? Because he developed a a system to help feed the world? Was he a patriot? Because he helped his nation fight a war? 
Was he a horrible husband for pushing his wife to the brink of suicide? Was he an evil villain using his powers for evil? Or was he a victim of the Nazi party that abused his research to kill his own people? His life is just a simple illustration of sometimes it can be hard to distinguish between heroes and villains and victims in a complex and broken world. Which leads us today to the story of Joseph. If you've got your copy of the Word of God, I hope you will join us in Genesis chapter 37. The key text is in Scripture, but we're going to look at a lot of Genesis 37 today. We're going to get to read this Joseph story in the month of November. It's this fantastic story. It's the last 14 chapters of Genesis. It's one of the great short stories in all of Scripture. Andrew Lloyd Webber made a great musical out of this, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. It's been made in a variety of movies. DreamWorks did an animated version, Joseph, King of Dreams. Veggie Tales even has a story. If that's your speed, you can read uh, or watch Ballad of Little Joe. It's a fascinating, great short story. Rags to riches, you know, sold into slavery, rises to power, second in command. But what I hope that you'll see this month as we read this story together is that you will be encouraged to faith in God in a very complex and broken world. And I also hope that you'll see as we read the Joseph story, there are breadcrumbs of the Jesus story all throughout the Joseph story. There are hints and echoes of the Christmas story, which is good because we are drawing near to Christmas. Can you believe it or not? Christmas is coming. This in the year that will never seem to end. There is a Christmas, and hopefully we can move past all of this And so we we want to pay attention to the hints that gives us to the Christmas story. Uh, But I just want to remind you, a lot of times we do this with Bible stories that we we know, we kind of remember the, the short version of it, and we forget all the complexity. I want to draw your attention to the complexities of this story. It's a really neat story. What I hope that you will be encouraged today is answer to that question, why you should trust God in a very broken and complex world in which you live. So let's begin by reading Genesis chapter 37. Let's read the first 11 verses as we bring them on the screen. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream. And told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I've dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. It begins, these are the generations of Jacob. And then we get into the story of Joseph. The generation part of Jacob actually will come the latter part of this story. Let me remind you who Jacob is. So there's Abraham. Abraham's son is Isaac. Isaac's son is Jacob. And then Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Jacob, who is Israel, has 12 sons. The 12 sons of Israel become the 12 tribes of Israel. So when we talk about the children of Israel or the tribes of Israel, we are talking about the 12 sons of uh, Jacob. Joseph, at this point in the story, is a 17-year-old kid. Let me show you where he fits in this family line. Jacob has four wives. He has son of all four wives. Joseph is son number 11, so he's not definitely not the oldest. He's not the youngest. He's next to the youngest, but he is the first son of Jacob's favorite wife. And so Jacob, uh, Joseph becomes Jacob's favorite son. 
The story begins with Joseph coming and brings a bad report to his father about his brothers. Now, we are not told whether the report was true or whether the report is needed. And I know at this point in the story, you know the story of Joseph and Joseph is the hero and you think he's the good guy. But at this point, he just sounds like a 17-year-old tattletale who's snitching on his brothers. And his brothers hated him. And all the brothers in the world said, amen, right? Um, And if that's not worse enough... Jacob makes it very clear that Joseph is his favorite. He, he makes him a very fancy colored coat. Now, colored fabric at this day was very expensive. It was expensive dyes to make colored fabric. So this was an expensive coat that proclaimed to the world which one was the favorite. Now, as every family knows, when the parents make it very clear who the favorite child is, it does great things for family dynamics, right? It just works like a charm. But beyond that, because he has this fancy clothes, he's probably not working working in the fields, right? He has been promoted to management, and he is the next to the youngest child, and he's a snitch and a tattletale, and his brothers hate him. This is going to go well, right? And on top of that, he begins to have dreams. Now, dreams play a big part in this story. Joseph, kind of cataloged in there with Daniel, has dreams, interpret dreams. Also, there's a lot of dreams in the Christmas story, too. Remember, there's these hints of the Christmas story that's coming. Joseph has a dream. Now, it doesn't tell us that God gave him this dream, but as we read the rest of the story, I think that's a fair way to read the story. He has this God-given dream, but I've always wondered the question, should he have told his brothers this dream? If Joseph had come to me and said, should I tell my brothers this dream, I would have said, ixnay and the imdre, right? This is not going to go well. They already can't speak peacefully to you. They already hate you. You've already got this family. Just write about it in your journal, but don't tell anybody. But he comes and he tells his brothers, and his brothers very clearly know what the dream means. And so they hate him even more. This is the third time the brothers, it says the brothers hate him. Then he has another dream. And he tells this one to his dad. And even dear old dad who loves him and it's his favorite son, even that was enough for dear old dad. Dear old dad rebukes him. But notice it says, his father kept the saying in mind. Do you remember in Luke chapter 2 when the shepherds come to watch, uh, to adore the baby Jesus? And Mary's watching everything that goes on. Remember how that section ends? She treasured all these things and she pondered them in her hearts. We're hearing in her heart. We're hearing these echoes of the Jesus story that's coming. Well, the story continues. I won't read the rest of it, but you know how the story goes. It says the brothers go out to tend the flocks. Joseph in his management coat is at home. And so daddy comes to Joseph and says, I want you to go out in verse 14 and go check on your brothers and bring me back a report. Now, this is how the story goes. We know this is not going well right? We know this story is not going to end good, but he goes out and he is going to spy on his, or check on his brothers, however version you want to read that story, and he's going to bring back a report, and his brothers see him coming from far off, glowing in this Technicolor dream coat, and we read there in verse 19, they said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him in one of the pits And then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. Reuben, who's the oldest brother, says, let's don't kill him. Let's just throw him in the pit. Reuben's plan is after this kind of ends, he's going to sneak back, rescue him out of the pit, and take him back home to daddy, and probably have a come-to-Jesus conversation with him along the way about his dreams, kind of straighten him out. So they decide, okay, we won't kill him. They, they strip him of his robe, and they throw him into a pit. And then it says in verse 25, they sat down to eat. Now, this does not mean they just grabbed a quick PB and J to get some calories. They sat down to eat. They had a party. They had a celebration. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Celebrate good times. The snitch is out of our lives. They are rejoicing. They sat down to eat. And then suddenly a caravan comes along. And then notice in verse 26, Judah says to his brothers. Now, who's Judah? Judah is the fourth son, not the oldest, not the youngest, but he's the fourth. Surprise, surprise, Judah's mom is different than Joseph's mom. You could see that one coming. And Judah says to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood, come let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he's our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. We should not kill our own brother. Let's sell him for cash. 
right? So I mean, just a step north of that. Well, you know how the story goes. They sell him to the slaves, to, uh, to the slave traders for 20 shekels of silver. Again, don't you hear the echo of the Jesus story? Judas betrays Jesus for pieces of silver. Here, Judah betrays his brother for 20 shekels. Reuben returns, finds his brother's not in the pit. He gets caught up on the story. He goes along with the party line. They go back to their father. They take the robe, and it says in verse 31, they took Joseph's robe, they slaughtered a goat, and they dipped the robe in the blood. Incidentally, this is why we're calling the sermon series Dipped in Blood, the cover art for this month. This was designed by Samantha Raleigh, one of our college students. Uh, We're playing off the dipped in blood because this is where Joseph's story begins, but because of all the gospel hints out of the story, and the whole story is about how God brings life out of death, dipped in blood. They take this robe back to daddy at the end of chapter 37. They say he must have been torn to pieces. Jacob is mourning and mourning and mourning, and then the chapter ends in verse 36 that these traitors sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Now, I know you know the rest of the story is coming, but what if you didn't? At this point, what you would know is Joseph, favored son, everything was going great, given dreams of greatness, betrayed by his family, uh, sold into slavery, gone forever. Basically, you would anticipate that he disappears from the face of the earth. Because, chapter 37, verse 1, we're into a new story. And you would think that that story is over. Then we get to chapter 38. Bible scholars today still tend to wrestle with the idea of why does chapter 38 follow chapter 37? Now, I know the numbers, that's the way that works. But, but this story, the Joseph story starts in chapter 37 and goes to the end of Genesis. There's only one chapter in there that has nothing to do with Joseph, and it's chapter 38. And the question is, why did they put it here? Is it misplaced? Should it have been put somewhere else? Why, or should it have just been left out altogether? I want to suggest to you today that this is a key part of the introduction of this story. It is not misplaced. It is here for a reason. It has nothing to do with Joseph. Well, kind of. You'll see. It's about Judah. It's a long chapter. And let, instead of reading it to me, let me just tell you the story. It goes like this. This is not a G-rated chapter. There is no VeggieTale version of chapter 38 of Genesis, at least not that I know of. Okay? So... Parents, you may have some conversations on the way home from church. That's all I can say. Judah, we find out, goes and he marries a Canaanite woman. Abraham had told his descendants, don't marry into the Canaanites. They worship other gods. Don't worship those, don't marry into those who worship other gods. Judah doesn't care. He goes and he marries a Canaanite woman. We don't even know her name. Has three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. And takes a woman from among the Canaanites named Tamar, and she takes her to be the wife of oldest son. We find out that oldest son is very wicked, so God just strikes him dead. So Tamar now is a widow. She, they have, haven't had any children yet. So the custom of the day is if you are a widow and you haven't had any children yet, uh, you would be uh, given as wife to child number two to marry with child number two. And then the first child that you have out of that marriage arrangement actually is considered to be a child of your deceased brother. And that way it continues the lineage of your brother's family. So Judah, trying to do the right thing, takes Tamar and gives her to to child number two, son number two, as wife. Son number two does not like this arrangement and does not want to provide an heir for his brother, so he refuses to do it. That's the G-rated version. You can read the scriptures, the specific details about that. But evidently, this is so wicked in the eyes of God, God drops him dead. Now, the right thing for him to do is now to take Tamar and to give her to child number three to be wife and to produce heirs now for the other two brothers. But Judah says, this woman is toxic. Everyone who gets close to her dies, right? Uh, ignoring the fact that it's because his two boys are wicked. That's why they die. But says, I don't want child number three to be anywhere close to Tamar. So what he says to Tamar is, you know what? My third son's not quite old enough. Why don't you go back to your daddy's household? And when my son grows up, then I'll give him in marriage to you. Meaning the whole, knowing the whole time he has no intention of doing this. He's just trying to get rid of her. But it puts Tamar in a horrible position because she's really not part of her father's household. And now she's being exiled from her father-in-law's household, which is where where she belongs. So now she is really a woman without a household, which is a very precarious place to be in ancient Canaan. But that's where she is. Time passes. uh, The child, the son grows up. Tamar begins to realize Judah's never going to give me 
uh, son number three in marriage. And so she takes matters into her own hands. She dresses up and pretends to be a prostitute, sits outside the gates of the city. Judah comes into the city, sees a prostitute, uh, makes a proposition. They negotiate payment. They decide payment is going to be a goat. He doesn't have a goat with him. And so she says, well, give me some kind of pledge that you'll pay me. And so he gives to her his ring, a cord, and staff, very personal items that obviously belong to him. Later, after things are, are done, he sends the goat with a friend to try to make payment, but they can't find her. And Judah says, well, just forget about it, and let's just hope this whole thing goes away. Three months later, she comes up pregnant. She's pregnant by her father-in-law, Judah. She comes up pregnant. Of course, Judah doesn't know this. Judah finds out that she is pregnant and so hauls her up and she decides that she should be put to death because of her immorality. Now, Judah doesn't have a whole lot of high moral ground to stand on, right? I mean, so far he's uh, betrayed his brother, sold him into slavery, lied to his father. Uh, He's promised uh, to this daughter-in-law. He's failed to do the right thing by her twice. Uh, he's guilty of immorality, of prostitution. Doesn't have a whole lot of high moral ground to stand on, but because of what she's done, he's going to have her put to death. And she says, well, before you do this, let me just name the father of my child. And she brings out the ring, the cord, and the staff. And it's Judah. And notice what Judah says in verse 26. Judah identified them, being the ring, the cord, and the staff, And said to Tamar, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son, Shelah. She is more righteous than I, since I did not do the right thing to do. Then the chapter ends, we find out that she gives birth to two twins, Perez and Zerah. And it just ends. Now, what we know from the book of Ruth is that Perez is going to be the great, 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 ten times grandfather of David. And if you read the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, it says Judah is the father of Perez by Tamar. Tamar is one of four women who are listed in the genealogy of Jesus. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and then, of course, Mary. She would be the fifth one. But this is how the story ends. We don't know what becomes of Tamar. Does Judah take her back into the household? Does Judah ever give her to her third son in marriage? Does Judah do the right thing? We don't know. We don't know what becomes of Judah. At this point, Judah is pretty much a scoundrel. There's not one redeeming thing that you can say about Judah so far. And what's become of Joseph? Favorite son, dreamer, snitch, betrayed by his own brothers, now lost in slavery somewhere. And this is the introduction to this great story. One of the reasons we like this story so much is because the story illustrates what all of us really know. Life is really messed up. And the world in which we live is broken, broken, broken. I mean, you look at this story. It's hard to tell the good guys from the bad guys. That's why I told you the story about Fritz Haber at the beginning. It's hard. I mean, is is Joseph a good guy? Doesn't really start out as a good guy. Is Judah a scoundrel? Well, Judah changes. If you know the rest of this story at the back end, Judah's the one who's going to beg Joseph for mercy at the end. Judah is the the tribe of Israel from which the Messianic line comes through is the tribe of Judah. The Jewish people are known as Jews because of the name of Judah. I mean, Judah becomes a significant person, but at this point in the story, he's nothing but a scoundrel. Matter of fact, the only thing that's only person who has any hint of righteousness altogether is Tamar. And she's pushed to desperate measures to try to make things right in this broken world in which she lives. We like this story because it reminds us that we live in a world where sin is rationalized into the fabric of our culture. The story begins with a a man who's got four wives. Genesis 1-1 begins, uh, it tells us in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 that marriage is between one man and one woman and they become one flesh. And yet you read Genesis and all these multiple marriages and polygamy going on and it's always just an absolute mess, but it was just kind of woven into the fabric of their culture. We see slavery. You know, the Ishmaelites come along and they say, hey, you want to buy our brother? And they're not shocked. (gasps) Why would we buy another human? That's horrible. No one does that. No, they just say, hey, 20 shekels here, 30 shekels in Egypt. I can get 50% return on my investment. It's, it's just part of the fabric of society. Women at this point in world history are basically property. 
Tamar is taken, Tamar is given, Tamar is given. She is a, a female without a household, and if, if you are a female without a household, you really have no economic future. Prostitution becomes one of the few courses of recourse. It's just part of the fabric of creation at that time. Now, today in our life, we no longer have polygamy, slavery, and women are, you know, are no longer second-class uh, uh, second persons. They can own property. They have inheritance rights. They can vote, blah, blah, blah. But we do have greed and lust and immorality and violence and racism and abuse of power and corruption. We have many forms of sin that are woven into the fabric of our culture that's just part of the world in which we live. In this story, we like it because we see families are messed up. Part of the hope of heaven is that we're going to be one household of faith, fellow citizens, fellow members of the household of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. And that may be what your family looks like today, or this may be more what your family looks like today. Families are messed up. And we see in the world today, just like in these two chapters, where the powerless are just trampled by the very fabric of the culture in which they live. Tamar is basically powerless from the very beginning. She's a female in a, in a society where she has very little value, and she is just taken and given at ends. But even Joseph, who starts off the story with all of the advantages, he's the favorite, he's the, the heir, he's all of that, and yet still the violence of 11 violent men turned that all in its head in an instant. And he becomes a nothing. This is the world in which we live. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Don't you feel encouraged? Just warm hearted. Life is good. The question is this. Why should we trust God in a complex and broken world? You see, this is why the question really becomes a real question. There is something inside of us. I don't know if it's part of our sin nature or just part of our hopes, but there is something inside of us that is hardwired that says if we trust God, what should happen is everything gets made right, right? Only good things happen to the good, only bad things happen to the bad. There's never anything bad happens to the good and everything good happens to the bad. Righteousness is rewarded, wickedness is always punished, right? Everything is made right, everything is made whole. That's instinctive what, what we think should happen when you trust in God. God shows up and makes everything right. And yet you know from your story and you know from reading Scripture, that's not the way that it works. That evil will not be banished until the very end. And until then, we live in a broken and messed up world. So the question again is, then why should you trust in God in the midst of a broken and messed up world? If God's not going to make everything right, doesn't it make just more sense just to forget about God and go on your own? Why should you trust, about, trust God in this world? I was wrestling this week with trying to answer that question, and I realized the answer was right there. Psalm 118 is our scripture memory verse for this week. I don't pick the scripture memory verses. I follow the fighter versus scripture memory program. It's a five-year scripture memory thing. It's chosen years in advance. This is the verse that was assigned for this Sunday. It was not a verse that I, I picked because I thought it would go well with the sermon. It was just laying out there. This is the memory verse for this week. Hear it again. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. And the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. And I realized the answer to that question was right there in Psalm 118. Just four statements to help you see between the story of Joseph and Tamar and Psalm 118 to answer that question, why should we trust God in a broken, complex world? The first reason is this, we should trust God because God has promised to be by our side. So Psalm 118 says, the Lord is by my side. I will not fear. The Lord is by my side. 
as my helper. And as the story of Joseph unfolds, one of the things, statements you're going to hear spoken over Joseph several times is the Lord was with him. He's in Potiphar's house and the Lord was with him. He's in the prison and the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. God has promised to be with us in a broken and complex world. And because he's by our side, it makes a difference. The psalmist says, the Lord is by my side as my helper. I shall not fear. You know the statement from the New Testament? God's promise, I will never leave you, never forsake you. Raise your hand if you've heard that before. You know that? Do you know where it comes from? Hebrews chapter 13. Let me read you the, the full context. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. That statement, I will never leave you, never forsake you, comes out of the promise of Psalm 118, which is your scripture memory verse this week. Because of that confidence, because God has promised, I will be by your side as you walk through this broken world. That's why you should trust God in this broken and complex world. Second thing, we should trust God in this broken and complex world because God is at work in us, through us, and around us even when we can't see it. That's the key part. I mean, y'all have heard me. My definition of grace, God's grace, is God at work in us, through us, and around us, doing what we cannot do by ourselves or for ourselves. God at work in us, through us, and around us, doing what we cannot do by ourselves or for ourselves. And we see this in the life of Joseph. God is at work in Joseph. God gives Joseph the ability to interpret dreams. We see God at work through Joseph. Joseph interprets the dreams of the people who are around him. Everywhere Joseph goes, God's blessings flow through him on Potiphar's household, flows through him onto the prison, flows through him onto Pharaoh's courts. Everywhere he goes, God's grace flows through him, and God's grace is at work around him. God is doing things around Joseph that Joseph could never do, giving the Pharaoh dreams, producing a famine, all of these things. God is constantly at work, but here's the problem. Joseph, in the middle of his life, couldn't see it, and neither can you. I doubt Joseph was riding on the back of that camel on his way down to Egypt saying, it's okay, it's going to work out. God's going to give me the ability to interpret dreams, and pretty much I'm going to run this place in seven years. Doubtful. And you can't see it either. Which is why we have to faith and we have to believe God is at work God is at work in me, God is at work through me, and God is at work around me, even when I have no visible evidence. That's why I'm trusting God in this broken and complex world. Third reason we should trust God out of this broken and complex world. We should trust God because He is always writing the victory story. He is always writing the victory story. The victory story is this. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. All things will be brought under the headship of Christ. Every enemy will be made his footstool. God is writing that victory story. That is the victory story. The problem is we want God to be finished with the victory story before he's finished writing. Right? If I was Joseph, I would want the victory story to be finished as soon as my backside hit the pit for the first time. I would have ridden it, they throw me in a pit, boom, I bounce right back up, and I'm floating above the ground in my amazing coat, and all the brothers are like, oh, you're so great, you know, let's have a party together, be reunited, end of story. But that's not where the victory story ends. It doesn't end there. It doesn't end in Potiphar's house. It doesn't end in prison. It doesn't end in Pharaoh's house. It doesn't end when Jacob and all of his family come to Egypt in the land of Goshen and live and prosper. It doesn't end there. It doesn't end for 400 years later when they are slaves in Egypt. It doesn't end with the Exodus story when they leave Egypt for the promised land. It doesn't end in the promised land because they are exiled and they have to come back. It doesn't even end Ezra and Nehemiah when they rebuild the wall. It doesn't end on Christmas when the incarnation and Christ comes. It does not end till the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise and death is no more. The victory story is a long way, right? But we want it to be finished now. 
And we have to remind ourselves that God is always writing the victory story and he's weaving our story into his victory story. Now, the good news is we have the rest of the story of Joseph. We don't have Tamar's story. We end and it just kind of, we run out of ink. It just kind of, there, you know, she gives birth. We don't know what's next. That's where most of us feel like we live our lives. God just ran out of ink. Everyone else's lives are being told, and we can see how God's working in their lives, but we just ran out of ink for mine. And we have to remember that God is writing the victory story, and your story will be a part of his victory story. That statement in Psalm 118 that says, I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. You may read that and say, well, I really don't have people who hate me in my life. Yes, you do. The spiritual forces of darkness hate you. You have a thief who roams about you to steal, kill, and destroy. You have a lion who wants to devour your life. You have the spiritual forces of darkness who want to destroy you. You have enemies that hate you. There will come a day when you will look in triumph on those who hate you. And it may not be at the end of this chapter of your story or at the end of the next chapter of the story. It may not even be at the end of your book. You may have to wait to the end of the series, but that victory story will be written and you will look in triumph on those who hate you. We just have to remember God is always writing the victory story. The last reason we should trust in God is that last statement in Psalm 118. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. Why should we trust God? Where else are you going to go? Where else are you going to go? Let's just say you get so frustrated with God. God, you're supposed to make everything right. God, you're supposed to take all the brokenness and solve it. I'm so frustrated with you. I'm going to stop trusting in you. Okay, where are you going to go? You're going to put your trust in, in an election. You're going to put your trust in a, a romance. You're going to put your trust in a career. You're going to put your trust in a bank account. You're going to put your trust in a hobby. Where, where else are you going to turn that is going to bring salvation in a broken and complex world? There's a great story. I think it's in John chapter 6 when, when Jesus has finished the feeding of the 5,000. He goes on this long, long sermon about what it looks like to follow him. And it says the crowd stopped following him because what he was saying was so difficult to hear. And so all these crowds dissipate, and Jesus turns, and he looks at his disciples and says, do y'all want to leave too? And I'm like, Peter says, where else are we going to go? You alone have words of life. That's what the psalmist is saying. If you get so frustrated, where else are you going to go? Where else are you going to put your hope in in the midst of a broken and complex world? God and God alone is the one who has the power to be with you, to work in through you and around you. God is the one writing the victory story. He is the only one that has words of life. I hope this morning, if you are here and you're in the pit. See, when you're in the pit, all you see is the walls of the pit. You don't see the rest of the story. And you're in the pit and you're wondering, can I trust God? Should I trust God in the pits? I hope you hear the psalmist this morning, the Spirit say to you, in your distress, call to the Lord. The Lord will answer you and the Lord will set you free. The Lord will be by your side. You need not fear. Really, what can man do to you? With Yahweh at your side as your helper, you will look in triumph on the enemy who hates you. And it is far better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in anything else. Amen.